Hey everybody, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. You know, Jesus' light is the light that leads us home to a true and fulfilling relationship with God. In today's lesson, we're going to talk about that and about how to follow that light and be fulfilled. Welcome to Higher Ground with Richard Harris. Get ready to be transformed by God's Word. Discover your true identity and experience the power and love of Jesus. And now, here's Pastor Richard. Hello, everybody. We are in the middle of a, of a great and incredible series here called Jesus in His Own Words. I hope that if you've been following along, that this is a blessing to you. And maybe if you're just joining us today, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit of background with you. So uh, in the Gospels, Jesus referred to Himself many times, uh, beginning with the words, I am. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna know who Jesus Christ really was, we ought to look at what he said about himself. You know, he asked the disciples this in Matthew 16, whom do men say that I am? And then he said, Whom do you say that I am? This question, who is Jesus Christ, is the most important question that could ever be asked, and our answer is the most important thing that we could ever uh, consider or come, uh, you know, come to a conclusion about. And so we've been looking at what did Jesus say about himself. Many times he said, I am, and didn't follow it with anything. And he, in these places, it's clear that he's claiming God's eternal name for himself, the son of the living God. But in other places, he did say, I am, and followed it with some kind of a word picture that described who he is and specifically who he is for you and for me. So far, we've seen that he said, I am uh, the true vine and you are the branches. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. He said, I am the good shepherd in John 10. And he said, I am the door also in John 10. He said, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. And in John 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And if we look here in the gospel of John chapter 8, we see a passage that's actually quite incredible. And we're going to dive into that in more detail depth this time. And we can see here in John chapter 8 that Jesus is the eternal, self-existent, self-sufficient light. He is the true light, number two, the true light, the only light that satisfies. And today, number three, let's begin with the darkness cannot stop the light from shining, but people can and do choose darkness over the light. So let's go there now. All right. So in John chapter 1, verse 5, that we're, we're not, let's jump out of chapter 8 and go back to John chapter 1. We see that the light of God in Jesus Christ is unrestrainable, right? Verse 5 says, The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. In other words, darkness can't stop light. But if you go down a little further in verse 10 and 11, we can see that light can be rejected. Verse 10 he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. You see, when you turn the light on in a room, for example, people can choose to close their eyes, can't they, instead of enjoying the light. In John 3, 19, it tells us that people rejected Christ because they actually loved darkness rather than light. It says, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, going back to the bedroom analogy, when you walk into a bedroom and you turn the lights on, if someone's sleeping in that bed, they may cover their eyes because the light is such a shock, right? Or if you go somewhere, you turn on the light and there's cockroaches, for example, they'll run, won't they? Rats will flee. This is how human beings are sometimes. They love their sin and don't want it exposed. You know, sin says you're in control. You can be satisfied with your own efforts or with that thing, whatever it is that you're hooked on or connected to, whether it's money or whether it's lust or whether it's drugs or alcohol or whether it's whatever, just plain old rebellion. You know, sin says this will satisfy you. You just need it once more. You just need it this time. On a recent uh, Truth and Liberty livecast, I had a guest on the show named Craig DeRoche, who's the, the head of Family Policy Alliance, a wonderful organization, wonderful man. But he at one time was addicted to alcohol. He said something that was super profound and that struck me. 
he said, um, I think in the in the we were talking about the the transgender movement at the time, and, and he said, you know, transgenderism is not the problem; it's the solution. At first, I kind of did a double take. I'm thinking, what do you mean it's the solution? He's saying he's not saying it's the solution. He's saying it's their solution. In other words, we all have a solution in our carnal minds. It's the thing that we desire, but it's not the answer. It can't satisfy because the real problem is that every one of us has a need for unconditional love. Every one of us has a need for acceptance by God. Every one of us has an has a need built into the inside of us to know God personally and intimately. And there is only one solution that satisfies that, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ, the light of the world. To experience the benefit of that life, we have to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, as, as we saw, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. You see, we have to follow him. Following Jesus, is, it, it, it begins, right? There's always a beginning to a journey. That's when we accept him and submit our hearts and lives to him. But it's not just a one-time experience. It's a lifelong journey. It's an everyday experience. Following him means we go where he goes and we do what he does. And we do what he asks us to do. First John, the epistle, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Listen to this. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, you might translate that and say, if we say that we have fellowship with him but we're not following him, we lie and we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. So the fourth point out of John chapter 8 about Jesus being the light of the world is that the light has come to lead us home and not just to lead us home, but to lead us to our eternal home of fellowship with Almighty God. Now, when Jesus said this in John 8, he said, I'm the light of the world. He was, in a, he was actually in the temple area, all right, in Jerusalem. And he was in a specific part of it called the Court of Women. Uh, it was during a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, we know this because of a couple of details that are given to us in John chapter 7 and John chapter 8. And it's going to take a little time for me to unpack this, but I, but I need to do it to give you the background of what was going on at the time, because it's a powerful picture of Jesus being the true light of the world that leads us home to our eternal home in God. John chapter 7 verse 2 tells us that it says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Go down a little further. John seven fourteen tells us that Jesus went to the feast at the temple in Jerusalem. Verse 14 says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up unto the temple and taught. And then in John chapter 8, verse 20, it says that he is in the treasury area of the temple. And so it says there in verse John 8, 20, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. Okay, so the treasury in the temple is, um, is in a larger section called the court of women. All right. So now what's this feast of tabernacles? Let's look at that for just a second. It's a feast that was required, set aside in the law of Moses and required for the Jews. It's one of the, the, the three feasts where they were supposed to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate it. And what it was was a reminder to the Jewish people of, the, of their journey in the wilderness. All right. The feast was seven days long and began with a special Sabbath day called a holy convocation. And then sacrifices were uh, commanded for each day of the feast. And then the eighth day after the feast was also a special Sabbath day. And so sometimes they call this the Feast of Booths uh, or Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T. Um, this feast was supposed to take place in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar every year. And began that month began with, the, with another feast, the Feast of Trumpets. So that was also a seven-day one, followed by the Feast of Atonement on day 10. So... The seventh month of the Jewish year was a big month for them. 
uh, as there were th three special feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, and then the Feast of Atonement on day 10, and then the Feast of Tabernacles beginning on the fifth, 15th day of that seventh month. So this Feast of Tabernacles, a seven-day-long feast, on the first day of the month, the Jews were required to take branches from trees and build shelters called booths or tabernacles, and then they would stay in those shelters during the feast. For seven days, they lived in those tabernacles. This was commanded by God in Leviticus chapter 23 and in Numbers chapter 29. I just want to share with you Leviticus 23, a few verses. In verse 39, in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take uh, you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And in verse 43, it says that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So I went into that detail about this Feast of Tabernacles for you to understand what was going on in Jerusalem and that this was supposed to be a reminder of their journey in the wilderness because it's all important for you to understand the significance of what Christ is saying. So the other thing I want you to know about the context here of Jesus' statement when he stood up and he said, I am the light of the world, is that in John chapter 7, there's a long debate that erupts between Jesus and the Pharisees about who he is. Jesus used the, the events in the Feast of Tabernacles to show people who he was. And the, and the first one that's um, not directly related to him being the light of the world, but it's, I want you to see this, is in John 7, um, it, the, one of the ceremonies that was performed, well, in John 7, he declared himself to be living water, right? One of the ceremonies that was performed in the Feast of Tabernacles was where the priests would go down to the Pool of Siloam, and there was a procession, and then they would come back singing and with music with the water that they drew out of that well, and they would pour it on the altar. Okay, and so in the midst of this event in the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood up and declared in John 37 and 38, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, so I'm going to come back. We're going to take a short break here, share some information, and I'll be right back after that to finish this up. Help advance the gospel by partnering with Richard Harris Ministries. Your donation will reach people worldwide helping them grow as disciples in Christ. Go to richardharrisministries.com and become a partner today. Okay, we're back after that short break. And we are looking at John chapter 7 and chapter 8, where Jesus declared in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And I'm giving you the context in John chapter 7 and John chapter 8 so we can fully appreciate and understand the power of what Jesus was saying. And, and I was explaining before the break that in John chapter 7, there was a debate between Jesus and the Pharisees about who he was. And also that, they, that he's there at the temple uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles was set aside by God for the, for the Israelites, for the Jewish people, to remember what God did for them in their journey in the wilderness. And there's some things that happened in this Feast of Tabernacles that Jesus used to show the Jewish people and to show us who he was. One of the things that happened was this ceremony that happened every day where the priests would go down to the Pool of Siloam from the temple. They would get water and they would come back up to the temple and they would pour water with a golden pitcher on the western side of the altar. And this was a commemoration of when God drew water out of the rock in the wilderness in the Old Testament. And so after that, Jesus stands up in the, at the end on the last day, and he says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. And he said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, I'm just showing you this today to demonstrate that um, uh, this is an example of how Jesus is using the backdrop of the Feast of Tabernacles to show us and the Jewish people who he was, okay? 
So let's get back to the story. They continued debating after he said that the rest of the day in John chapter 7. And then verse 53, John 53 says that each went to his own home. And then John chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it says Jesus went to the Mount of Olives that night. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. As Jesus was sitting there in the court of women, we know, we know that he's in the court of women because John chapter 8, verse 20 tells us that he's in the treasury. And then John 8, 3, 11 is the story of when the woman is caught in adultery and brought before him and they want him to condemn her and he refuses to do it. Okay, so this is the context of John chapter 8, verse 12. Verse 12 follows immediately after the woman's, the story of the woman caught in adultery. And here Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So he's in the temple, and this is important. He's in the, in the, uh, in the court of women. Because in the Feast of Tabernacles, in the court of women, the Jews would erect two giant, actually four giant candelabras right there. Each one of these was 75 feet tall. These candelabras were really giant menorahs. And they would be lit. They would climb up on ladders to light these giant menorahs at the top, these huge torches, if you will. And the, the light from the fire on those 75-foot tall menorahs would light the city of Jerusalem. It lit the temple courts and the entire city so that it could be seen from all over the city and the surrounding area. This light coming from the temple enabled people dwelling in tabernacles in the feast to see and to find their way to the temple. See the, and, and so um, the temple, of course, is where God in the Old Testament lived. You see, in the same way, Jesus uses this symbolism of the feast to show himself not just as living water, but as the light of the world. In the wilderness, God led the Jews, you see, through the darkness, the Bible says, with a pillar of fire by night. Now, today, he leads us in our, to our promised land with the light, uh, the light of the world, his son, Jesus Christ. Let's look at the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 13, verse 20. It says the Jewish people, they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by the day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Go ahead to, to the book of Nehemiah, where the, the Bible says, Moreover, thou lettest them by day by a cloudy pillar, and by the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. You see what was happening. The Hebrews, the Jews, they were in a transition place, weren't they? They had been set free from slavery. They had gone through the Red Sea and they were, uh, they were delivered and they had received the law of God, but they were not yet to their promised land. You see, now God in Jesus Christ is leading us through our wilderness, through our transition, because we've been saved. We've been born again. The law of God is now written on our hearts We've left Egypt, the world, in a spiritual sense, but we've not yet reached the fullness of our promised land. We've come out of slavery, but we're not in the fullness of our inheritance yet. And Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is our pillar of fire who leads us. In John chapter 16, verse 13, the Bible says, How be it when he, this is Jesus himself speaking, and he promises us that when he goes away, the Spirit of truth is going to come, and he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. When we surrender our lives to Christ, the light comes into our heart. The Word is written on our heart. The Spirit comes to live in our heart, and we suddenly discover a whole new world, a world where love and goodness rule, a world of adventure in Christ, a world of love, peace, and hope. We're, we're not in the world, and yet we are still in this wilderness period, but it's filled with love and peace and hope. It's filled with purpose and destiny. What we used to love, we now despise. This was me after I surrendered my life to Christ. 
And I just want you to know, guys, when we follow Jesus, he becomes our light day by day through this life in relationship with him. Prayer and listening and praise, thanksgiving, keeping his face always before us. But when we follow the light, uh, when we follow the word of God, when we follow Jesus in this light, light, he is that pillar of fire that leads us through the wilderness. Um, you know, in John chapter 8, a little bit further along, after he says, I'm the light of the world, in verse 31, he says, to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, Jesus is the word, and he's, but, but his word is also contained in, by revelation in the Holy Bible, in the scriptures. And he's saying to us, if you abide in my word, you're going to experience the light of God in, my li in your life, and you're going to be my disciple. Indeed, you're going to know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. You know, John, uh, the same principle can be found not just in John 8, but in John 1. Because after he tells us that Jesus is the word, immediately after that, he tells us that Jesus is the light. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And then in verse 4, it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So this thought is picked up again in John 8, verse 12, where he says he's the light of the world. The, the, he's the light and he's the word and the word is the light. We see it in the Old Testament too. Psalm 139, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So uh, the sixth principle or the sixth takeaway from this passage in John 8 is, um, see, J Jesus, I said, in the, is the light that comes to lead us home to fellowship with Almighty God. Just like the giant candelabras in the, temp in the court of women in the temple area, Jesus himself stands up and says, I am the light of the world, right? But we also know from the Bible that this light of God is the law of love. The light of Jesus, it's simple and it's clear. Even though it's not necessarily easy on the flesh, the simplicity of Jesus' words and his commands are really astounding. John chapter 13, he says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. After 1,200 years living under 613 laws and countless rules, and interpretations plus the oral law and all of this system, this religious system that the Jews were living under, Jesus points the way forward with one commandment. First John chapter 2, verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And then again, a new commandment I write unto you. So it's new and it's old. But he says, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. First John chapter 2, verse 8. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother, listen now, abideth in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So we're talking about Jesus being the light of the world. And to walk in that light, we must walk in the law of love. Loving God and loving one another actually fulfills all the commandments of the Old Testament, where Jesus said in Matthew 22, 34 to 40, when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then it says, then one of them, which was a lawyer, stood up asking him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, brothers and sisters, God is love. And as we walk in love, we reflect him and we fulfill our purpose. We walk in the light, Jesus Christ, who is the light of God and the light of the world. All right. Well, I'm out of time for today's lesson. 
Next time, come back. We're going to finish up the, our, 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 uh, the idea that Jesus said when he said, I am the light of the world. And then we're going we're gonna to continue on in our study of uh, Jesus in his own words. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be a blessing. I look forward to being with you next time. Today's teaching, Jesus in His Own Words, is available as a digital download or on a USB flash drive containing audio, video, notes, and discussion questions. Go to richardharrisministries.com and order your copy today. Hey everybody, I wanted to let you know that Richard Harris Ministries is on social media. So if you want to go to YouTube and find our channel there, Richard Harris Ministries, you can subscribe there. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, follow us there and uh, you'll stay connected to our ministry. Also wanted to let you know that, it, that uh, our program, Higher Ground with Richard Harris, is available on podcasts. So just go wherever you like to listen to podcasts, search for Richard, uh, Higher Ground with Richard Harris and you'll find us there. Thanks so much. On our website, you can watch all of Pastor Richard's television broadcasts on demand. While there, you will find resources and study materials for yourself and your home church. Purchase a video series and receive Richard's personal study notes, as well as discussion questions for your small groups. Visit us at richardharrisministries.com. For more teachings by Richard Harris, information about home churches, or to partner with Richard Harris Ministries, visit us at richardharrisministries.com or write to us at P.O. Box 7570, Woodland Park, Colorado, 80863. Join Pastor Richard next time on Higher Ground. I remember asking my mom uh, after I got filled with God's Spirit and was on fire for God what she thought about Jesus. And she said, well, I, you know, he was a good teacher. I said, Mom, why did he die on the cross? She said, I think he died on the cross to teach us how we should suffer, right? And uh, she didn't really understand him as Lord and Savior. But then once she got terminal cancer, she began to look at that question anew. And I'll never forget when uh, I was sitting with her and she told me that she understood that Jesus died for us because he loved us and that he paid the price for our sins. And um, there's something about looking into eternity and realizing um, that your eternal destiny is at stake at stake. Death is the ultimate de uh, weapon of the devil. It silences the image of God in the earth is what it does. It cuts off human potential vision. It cuts off the good that God hopes to do through every one of us. It brings, um, it brings, it brings everything to an end. And without the hope of eternal life, what do we have? What is all of this about? You know, bringing something back to life seems to be seems to us to be the most difficult miracle possible we might believe yeah god can heal god can do this god can do that but when it comes to resurrection oh wait a second that's a whole other deal that's next time on higher ground